And you've probably heard of this idea of a secret rapture, especially if you live in an American context, but I think it's, it's become more well known around the world um, in our day and time. So when people talk about the rapture, they're going to, this isn't the only passage in the New Testament that people will use and appeal to to, sub- to uh, substantiate that doctrine. But it's definitely the the locus classicus. I mean, this is the classic text because it actually uses the language of a rapture or being caught up, right, in the clouds. So let's read the the words of Paul with that in mind and we'll ask ourselves, is Paul describing here a rapture, a secret rapture, or is he talking about something else? And as you'll see, the answer is something else, but I want you to walk with me through the verses so that we can see in context exactly what that something else is. So, in 1 Thessalonians 4.13, we read this. But we would not have you ignorant, brethren, concerning those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and who are left until the coming of the Lord shall not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the archangel's call, with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And then we who are alive, who are left, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Pause there. The first thing I need to do is let's just get the rapture nonsense off the table here so that we can actually look at what Paul is trying to say here. So what makes some interpreters think Paul is talking about a secret rapture of Christ is verse 17 there when he says that we will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Now it's fascinating here that this Protestant tradition of a rapture uh, is actually based on a Latin translation of Paul's word here. So the, in the Latin Vulgate translation of 1 Thessalonians 4, the, the word for caught up is rapiemur, right? To be caught up together in the clouds. And so that word becomes the root for the rapture, the catching up, the gathering up the, um, of the true believers in Christ. And in Protestant dispensationalism, in American Protestant dispensationalism, especially since the late 19th, early 20th century, the idea of the rapture is basically this that before the great tribulation breaks out at the end of time, for this period of suffering that will precede the final judgment takes place, that there is going to be a secret catching up, a secret rapture of true believers, so that they will disappear from the earth, and they won't have to suffer through that time of tribulation. They'll be raptured. And those who are left behind in the world will suffer, experience the tribulation. Some will convert, some won't. And then finally, Christ will return at his second coming and will judge the living and the dead. Now, um, this novel idea has no basis in the text. It's it's a perfect example of proof texting, of taking one word out of context, one idea out of context, and making a false interpretation uh, on its basis. But if you look at the passage here carefully, you'll see that uh, Paul is not talking about a secret rapture. He's talking about a public parousia. He's not talking about a secret gathering up of the elects. He's talking about the public second coming of Jesus at the end of time that will coincide with the resurrection of the dead. And you can see that if you just read through the text and put it in context. So let's just work through it verse by verse and we'll see what I'm talking about. So. If you go back to verse 13, don't just start with 17, read the whole thing. It begins by Paul saying, We would not have you ignorant, brethren, concerning those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. Okay, pause. What's the context there? Well, in ancient Judaism, in Scripture, and in the New Testament, to sleep was a metaphor for death, right? So in our day and time, people will use other euphemisms for death. You probably heard people say, Oh, he passed, right? Well, he passed away. Well, that's a, a kind of gentle, kind way of saying that someone died, right? So it's a, it's a euphemism, describing somebody's going away rather than dying, right? 
So in first century AD, they would use the euphemism of sleep. So someone fell asleep was a way of describing the fact that they had died. So what's going on is that in the church of Thessalonica, some people have fallen asleep. They've died. And the Christians in that congregation who are converts from paganism, many of which don't have any solid beliefs or ideas about the afterlife, right, have lost hope because they assume that if you die before the second coming, then you won't actually be able to share in the resurrection. So there was, they were grieving over the dead, thinking that they would not be saved simply because they died too soon before the second coming of Christ. So Paul is saying, look, no, 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 no. I don't want you to grieve like the pagans who have no hope, right? Don't grieve over those who have fallen asleep because we believe, right? So he's going to give them the faith. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. In other words, what Paul is saying is, those who have died, if they've died in Christ, are actually going to come. They're going to return to us. They're going to come with Jesus when he returns at his second coming. He's going to bring them with him. So they're not lost. They are with Christ. And then he goes on to explain, he continues, For this we declare to you by the word of the Lord. So this is like a solemn declaration of divine revelation. That we who are alive and who are left until the coming of the Lord. Highlight that. So important. The Greek word there for coming is parousia. It is the standard word used by Jesus himself in the Gospels, but also by Paul to talk about the second coming of Christ. It literally means presence, but it means he's going to return. He's going to be with us, present with us again. So he says, I'm telling you solemnly that those of us who are alive and who are left until the parousia, the second coming of Christ, are not going to precede those who have fallen asleep. In other words, we're not going to have it any better off than those who have died, right? Because, verse 16, the Lord himself, this is Christ, will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the archangel's call, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. So he's describing the parousia of Jesus. And notice here, does this sound like a secret rapture? We've got the archangel's call, the cry of command, and the trumpet of God. This is not like you'll see in those rapture movies where they're flying on an airplane and all of a sudden, you know, half the airplane quietly just disappears because they've been raptured. That's just, the rapture doctrine proposes a secret coming of Jesus to gather his true believers. What Paul's talking about here is a public coming of Jesus at the end of time that coincides with the resurrection of the dead, right? Not the tribulation, but the resurrection of the dead. And he's saying when that happens, those who are dead in Christ, in other words, the believers who have died, they will rise first. So they're not going to be, they're not going to actually lose out they're actually going to be, in a sense, ahead of us. They will rise first, and then we who are alive, who are left, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So, pause here. What is Paul getting at? The whole driving force behind his words here is the anxiety of the Thessalonians over whether their dead brothers and sisters in Christ are going to lose their share in salvation. They're going to lose their share in the resurrection. And Paul's saying, no, they won't. Because here's what's going to happen. When Christ comes back, the dead in Christ will rise first, and then we will be gathered with them to meet Christ in the air. So you can imagine, is Christ coming down from heaven with the saints, and then the saints on earth being caught up to meet Christ and his saints together? So it's like a grand in gathering of all the elect of God, both the dead and the living, that will take place at the end of time. And the reason you know it's the end of time and not this secret rapture, which the Bible never talks about, is that Paul himself says, the dead in Christ will what? Rise first, right? So he's talking about two events, the second coming and the resurrection of the dead, right? He's not talking about a secret coming and the you know, disappearance of true believers. He's talking about the final coming and the resurrection of all the dead in Christ. And he says, so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with 
these words. So the point of Paul's exhortation here, the point of Paul's eschatology, is to give the Thessalonians comfort in the face of death. And this is easy to understand. If you look at the prophecies of Jesus in the Gospels, you can walk away from those prophecies. He's very clear. You don't know when the second coming is going to take place. So get ready, right? It's near. It's, I'm coming soon, you'll see in the book of Revelation. How soon? That remains a mystery. So in the first generation of the church, there was this expectation, as we'll see when we come to the 1 Thessalonians 5, that because we don't know the day or hour, Christ could come at any moment, and therefore, he could come soon. So, with that imminent expectation, when the first generation of Christians began to die, there were some people who were troubled by that and thought, well, wait, something's wrong here, something's gone amiss. What's going to happen to them? What will be the fate of the dead? That was something that had to be clarified by apostles like Paul, who said, the dead who are with Christ, who are in Christ and with him, will rise again, and we will be gathered together. They're not going to miss out on salvation. Now, what's fascinating to me about this passage is, if you want a framework for understanding Paul's description of the parousia here, you should actually, surprise, surprise, go back to the Old Testament. Because if you look in the book of Exodus chapter 19, verse 16 through 20, Paul seems to actually be getting some of the images that he uses to describe the second coming from the account of God coming down from heaven on Mount Sinai in the book of Exodus chapter 19. So I'll just give you a few of the parallels here. You can read, read it for yourself. 